Life Over Coffee, Conversations for Transformation. The cause of the clarity of God's Word, the path to life change, is not mysterious or elusive. Now, that is good news. I mean, if changing our lives were complex, we would all be in the soup. Did you know that Paul gave Timothy, his protege, a practical plan for change that we can replicate in our lives too? Now, I'm not suggesting that Paul's process for transformation is the final or the complete word, but it's one of the most excellent thumbnail sketches that you will find in Scripture. It is concise, it is understandable, and best of all, it is attainable. And so I want to share with you four sequential steps to change your life. Hello, everyone. This is Rick Thomas, and we are doing Life Over Coffee. Thank you so much for joining me. I am very glad that you are here. You can find me all day in my coffee shop. It is lifeovercoffee.com. We have a lot of resources. The shelves are slammed full of content. And so you can read, you can watch, you can listen. Please take advantage because those resources are free. Check out lifeovercoffee.com. Now I want to jump into Paul's four-step sequential plan for change, but let me begin by remembering a conversation that I had with our daughter many years ago. She knows what I do for a living. I do it a lot. And one day she said, Dad, why do you counsel someone so long? Now, you might not know this, but all of my counseling sessions are two hours. I've done that forever. Counseling is tough business, and it's also a relational context with people. And usually you don't know the person that you're meeting with. And so I just have never felt comfortable meeting with someone for 60 minutes because sometimes the things that you're talking about are complex and, and they're difficult. And sometimes they're actually, they are hard to hear. And so I've extended what I, what is probably typical or traditional counseling time from 60 minutes or 55 minutes to two hours. And well, our daughter knew that. And so she said, Dad, why do you, why do you counsel someone for so long? And I said, because it takes a while to help them change. Well, our daughter said, it seems that it would only take a minute. You say, repent. The person changes, and that's all you have to do. What else do you talk about with them? And we smile. Though our daughter does have a point, which can cause one to wonder, how much relational conflict and dysfunction we could eliminate if we followed her simplistic, and I will say overly simplistic approach. I'm sure it would clean up all of our messes if we just repented and got on with our day, but it would probably make a dent in some of the junk that we spread amongst our relationships. Because repentance is not native to us, God is patient as he comes alongside us to teach us how to change. After Adam first sinned, he decided not to repent and get on with his day. He chose rather to blame his problems on someone else. Have you ever tried that? As sons and daughters of Adam, blaming, rationalizing, justifying our problems away, those are just some of the things that tempt us as we adjust our fig leaves. Mercifully, God perseveres with us by not allowing us to stay tangled in our sinful isolation, creating a duality, who we are in reality, versus the person that we present ourselves to others, hoping they might like that version better than the person that we know ourselves to be. One of the primary means of grace the Lord uses to help us to change is his word which brings us back to Paul and what he was teaching his young protege, Timothy. He highlighted how God uses his word to change us by laying out a four-step plan for change. Now, my intent here is not to be as simple as our daughter was by suggesting this is all you need. No, it's not. I know better. You know better. 
But this is a working thumbnail, and I trust that it will stick with you for the rest of your life, and it will stick with you if you start applying it on a daily basis. Now, here's the passage that I'm referring to. It is 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Paul said this, All Scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Now, the words that I want to focus on here are just for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in that order. And that is my four-step process for change. Now, I realize for you exegetes that the point of the passage highlights and elevates God's inspired, sufficient, plenary, authoritative word. My aim here is not to devalue the text purpose. I'm not going to do that. But what I want to do is I want to turn it over again. I want to look at it just a little more practically. What if we highlight those four elements of change that Paul laid out for Timothy? What if we applied them to our lives? If you try this at home, I promise it will change your family dynamics. So let's begin with teaching, and then we will roll slowly through the other three, reproving, correcting, training, and we're going to ask a few insightful questions along the way to ensure that we're making those tweaks that will glorify God, transform us, and impact our relationships. Now, by the way, I have a lot of questions here, and let me go ahead and give you a spoiler alert. When you get to the call to action part at the end, well, the call to action will be all the questions that I'm going to ask you throughout. After God had regenerated you, now I I am assuming that you are a Christian. I realize that most of my audience is uh, what we say born again, but I also recognize that everybody that watches our videos or listens to the podcast, reads our content, they are not believers. But if God regenerated you, then you know quite well that he began to teach you his word, a process of recurring illumination from the Spirit of God, instruction, conviction, transformation, All those things fit within the basket of progressive sanctification. God's word is one of the primary means for us to mature into Christ-likeness. Through context, with people, the word of God penetrates our hearts for personal transformation. And so if we follow Paul's prescriptive progression in this passage, we will notice how The use of God's word is to stop dangerous thinking by reorienting our minds to sound teaching. As noted in the, what I'm calling here, the Timothy template, the Lord terminates inadequate teaching by reproving us. You see how teaching and reproof go together. We hear the teaching of God's word. And if there is something that needs to be terminated, well, we, we feel the reproof from God. And so the word reprove means to knock us down. Yeah, I mean, that's it. And the idea here is that the Lord brings sound teaching into our lives to put us on our backsides in Jesus' name. We began to see the light through the Spirit's illuminating conviction. How often has God brought his word to you to stop you from some course of action? That has happened more times than I can possibly remember in my life, and I'm sure that is your experience as well. Praise God for his word. And though sometimes God's adjustments can be inconvenient, other times it can be downright painful, It is his mercy to care so much about us. He wants to change us. And so before I proceed, would you take some time to assess yourself to see how well you are responding to Paul's first two points regarding the change process, teaching, 
reproving. And so the word of God is profitable for teaching and rebuking. Here are some helpful questions for you and your friends regarding your teachableness and receptivity to rebuke. By the way, for a a little bonus here, if you're married, it would be great for you and your wife to work through this or you and your husband to work through this at the same time, to ask these questions to each other as we're rolling through them right now. It could prove to be a wonderful leadership opportunity for both the husband and wife. And so I have two groups of questions, one for teaching and the other one for reproving. So let's start with teaching. Are you teachable? Ask a friend if you are easy to teach. If you have a spouse, well, you can do that right now. If you're going through this with your spouse, ask them about your teachability. Do you create an environment of grace to where they can step into that environment of grace and teach you? Whether it's a spouse or friend, the question is, are you not just teachable, but do you invite people into your space asking them to teach you? Question two, is it easy for people to care for you because of your hunger for the Bible's teaching? I believe it was in Job where he said, I, 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 I hunger for his word more than my necessary food. I love that passage of scripture. I got a story that goes with it, but I'll have to move on. Maybe I can share it at another time. Are you more concerned about learning than your reputation? Sometimes our reputation, that person that we trot out into the public space that we want people to appreciate, sometimes that's more controlling in our lives than the humility that we need to be vulnerable to be taught. Do you recognize that what you don't know outpaces what you do know? And so you're eager to learn. What we don't know is called omniscience. What we do know is called finitude. Our finite knowledge fits up inside of omniscience. And omniscience is a zillion times greater than our finitude. And so we recognize that what we don't know outpaces what we do know. And so we are eager to learn. The question again, are you teachable? Do you seek those you trust and are competent enough to teach you? Now, here's a, a word for the day. P- polling ignorant people is not wise. And so you're looking for those farther down the sanctification path than you are. Are you a question asker? Do you pursue others with questions about how to change your life while not succumbing to the temptation of letting their opinions manage you? Are you oversensitive? Does your insecurity hinder people from speaking into your life? Because teaching is the door through which you will grow, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Well, then it is incumbent upon all of us that we be teachable. And we will not be able to change our lives if we are not teachable. And so the first step, of the change process is our teachability. And by the way, your teachability is the litmus test that will inform others about your seriousness of growing in Christ. If you're unteachable, perhaps there will be those who want to care for you. They would love to bring instruction, but the sign on the door is clear. No trespassing. And so the first step in the four sequential step through the change process is teaching, And then right on the heels of that is rebuking or reproof. And so the question is, are you a rebukable person? And maybe those are the only two questions that you need for today. Are you teachable and are you rebukable? Wouldn't that be a great t-shirt? I am rebukable. Wear it loud and proud. Can you receive the corrective observations of others? When someone reproves you, how do you initially respond? Are you more focused on the person who said it and how they said it or how you can humbly react to it? Maybe you're asking, Rick, where did you get that question from? I got that question from, well, being a husband. I got that question from by actually doing it. You see, our entire website, I mean, I've, 99% of it is what I've 
produce myself and what I produce are my daily devotions. And so when I share something like this, is it comes from my experience. This is who I am or this is who I, I was. And so when I ask you, are you more focused on the person who said it and, and how they said it, or can you humbly react to it that may, that may cause you to want to pray for uh, Lucia? I'm doing better. I'm a work in progress. And I don't want to focus so much on what she says or how she said it, knowing that, well, sometimes she will say it wrong. I'll talk about that in just a moment. But the more important thing is where you put the accent mark. Are you more interested in learning before you respond to the messenger and how it was messaged to you? Are you tempted to sulk or go into self-pity mode after someone reproves you? If so, what does your response tell you about your relationship with God? Why is he not all-sufficient? Why is God not all-sustaining in your life? Perhaps fear of man is in play, managed by the opinions of other people. You permit their opinions to control you. That, by the way, also speaks to your relationship with God or your inferior relationship with God, your inadequate relationship with God. Also, as you think about fear of man or peer pressure, uh, codependency, some people call it. Uh, we have a course uh, at lifeovercoffee.com called No More Fear. It's an all online topical course. We've had a bunch of people to take this course. We had someone just write in today asking if they could use the course to uh, teach their small group. And so we're working to make that happen. And if you have questions about using it personally, or if you want to use it in a larger venue, please let us know. Uh, People are really benefiting from it. And one other side note, if you are a supporter of our ministry, you have an extra benefit because, well, you know that we have a private forum that only you can access. And so because of your support, thank you for underwriting this ministry, allowing these resources to go out freely. But because of your support, you can jump on the thread, the No More Fear thread, and you can talk to these other folks, other supporters who are taking that course as well. We're talking about being rebukable. Here's another question. Do you express gratitude to those who love you enough to bring correction into your life? You can measure your relational wealth by the number of friends you invite into your corrective care sphere. All parents should be shepherding their children to become part of this sphere as they mature. We trained our children that way when they were young. Well, guess what? They have arrived. They are young adults, and we were just having this conversation a few nights ago that they are at that place to where now they can bring corrective care into our lives. You can grow up your corrective care sphere by the number of children that you have. And if you train them uh, to care for you, I mean, ultimately, they will care for us physically, but we want them to care for us spiritually also. And so you can equip them and then release them and invite them into your space, release them from fear of man, and then invite them into your space so that you can be wealthier by having more and more people speaking into your life. Being reproved or being rebuked is tough stuff. Nobody enjoys it. To be willing to have others speak into your life is one of the high marks of Christian maturity. Rebukable people typically have humble and wise perspectives about themselves. They are rebukable because the gospel rightly informs them. Now, being informed by the gospel, it means they were in a helpless and worthless condition before the Lord chose to save them. They were dead in their sins. They were hell-bound, outside of God's grace, alienated from the life in God was their spiritual condition. The Lord's view of you before salvation was outside God's favor. Nothing anyone could say to you is worse than what the Lord has previously declared about you as an unregenerate soul. And understanding this aspect of the gospel prevents you from fearing what others can say or do to you. I mean, what could someone say to you that is worse than what God has already declared about you? 
being rightly informed by the gospel this way releases you from reputation management. But the news is not all bad. I mean, obviously, the gospel implies bad news, and I've just walked down a long path of bad news. But coupled to this gospel truth of what you were, past tense, to whom you are in Christ, present tense, you most assuredly have nothing to protect, nothing to fear, nothing to hide. If you have been born again, you are a child of the king, a person who has gone from the worst possible position that you could be to the best possible place you will ever know, from worst to first because of the gospel. You are not, you are, you're not, if you're not living in this daily gospel truth, then temptations will lure you toward insecurity that will motivate you to protect, to hide, to defend your reputation before others. This is not the kind of pride that you want. It's a pride that will truncate the effectiveness with which your friends can speak into your life, a soul-stunting posture before the Lord and others. And so while the gospel is good news, its message also implies terrible news. You would not need the good news if there were no bad news. And the same is true in Paul's progressive keys to Christian maturity that he laid out for his friend Timothy. You see, teaching, it brings reproof, bad news, which is supposed to knock us off our feet onto our backsides. Well, thankfully, the Spirit of God would never leave you down and out. He is the healer who binds our wounds. By the way, that's what the word correction means, the third word in the, in the equation. A careful and accurate rebuke from the Lord paves the way for his corrective measures that we can implement into our lives. The word corrected means to be stood up or to made erect. It can also be metaphorically like setting a bone that has been broken. You see, God is a fixer. He does not rebuke us because he enjoys bringing pain into our lives. Just like the gospel that I was sharing with you earlier, he brought pain into our life. He let us know that we were dirty, low-down, rotten sinners, but he did not leave us there. We have a Christ. And so he regenerated us, and we went from worst to first in our salvation, and this same process is mirrored in our sanctification. And so God's word teaches us in our sanctification. It knocks us down, but God is a fixer. He does not rebuke us because he enjoys bringing pain. There is always a redemptive purpose for his correction. If the Lord does not convince you of this, then you will be tentative about receiving reproof. Of course, some will argue that they don't mind the rebukes of God, but it is the rebuke of sinful people that rubs them the wrong way. Now, I understand why people would say this. Typically, it's because of a bad experience. But that is theologically deficient because God uses the agency of humanity. We cooperate with God in bringing corrective care to others like Nathan did to David, for example. You see, horizontal soul care is a problem for sure. And so I'm not, I'm not trivializing the complaint and I'm not dismissing it at all. I have received horizontal soul care that wasn't that spiffy. I mean, it would be great if, if we perfectly rebuked people, but that is impossible among fallen creatures. Imperfect people reproving imperfect people will have an element of imperfection in it. And though there is a lot to say about wrongful rebukes, the point for now is whether we are mature enough whether we are hungry enough to find the Lord's rebuke even through imperfect vessels. And we don't want to be too harsh here because those that we critique for bringing imperfect soul care to us, well, we have done the same thing. Can we learn anything from a poorly given rebuke? We can, if our goal is Christian maturity. I mean, maybe later you can go back to them and 
and help them, teach them. Maybe you can can teach them on how to admonish you in a more effective way. And so we're talking about correction here. Here's a few questions to think about. Are you more likely to focus on the reproof or the correction? Where are you going to slide the accent mark? The former tends to be proud, while the latter tends to be humble. Are you more preoccupied with arguing with the rebuker or maturing in your sanctification for God's glory? Do you believe you need others to help you walk through sanctification issues? Do you enlist the help of your friends so that you can change? Do you believe others need you so you can help them walk through their sanctification issues? There has to be a a reciprocality among mature friends. You want those reciprocal relationships. There will always be people where it's more uh, unidirectional, where you are instructing and teaching them. I mean, that's what biblical counselors do all the time. But biblical counselors need reciprocating relationships as well. And so we want to invite them into our lives and we trust that we're building relationships in such a way that they're inviting you into theirs. Would you say your commitment to change is more significant than your commitment to your reputation? Paul's four progressive and essential keys to change are, one, teaching. I want God's word to teach me. Reproving. As I learn from God's word, I expect it to reprove me occasionally. Three, correcting. To be reproved is a door that leads to correction. And number four, training. After I'm corrected, I jump on God's training track where I can run my race more effectively. Each time you make it through steps one, two, and three, you will be ready to participate in ongoing training for righteous living. And this process of progressive sanctification is not a one-and-done deal. These steps are recurring and unending until we see Jesus. Each day is a new opportunity to learn teaching, fall, rebuke, get up, correction, and run a new way training in righteousness. Imagine what it would be like if the Lord loved you enough to identify areas that could change your life daily. That kind of love invigorates the soul. Only Christians possess that kind of incremental, ongoing, unending, progressive path to freedom in Christ. Only Christians can change in long-term and sustainable ways. Imagine if the Lord saved you and left you to your former manner of life with no way of changing, no chance to mature spiritually. What about if we review? Number one, teaching. Here's the question. How often do you learn something from God's word? Whether it's from your own personal reading and study and reflection or someone speaking to you. Number two, rebuke. How often do you let the free conviction from the Spirit course through your mind? Number three, correction. How often do you benefit from his rerouting correctives? And then number four, training. How often have you taken a a new path to run your race for the Lord? By the way, tied to this is Psalm 23, 3. You know it, I'm sure. David said, he restores my soul. And then he explains how we experience soul restoration. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. If your soul needs restoration, then the way that you experience that restoration is by walking in paths of righteousness. And Paul just gave us a four-step template, teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in paths of righteousness. Now, I recommend that you teach your family and your friends this template to help them to mature in this progressive progress. Invite them into your growth plan. Appeal to them to come alongside you so you all can benefit from mutual and reciprocal gospel-shaped care. You're welcome to use all the questions that I've asked you under each step. 
I recommend that actually you add others along the way. Each person you meet with will add new insights. And the more you work through this template, you'll be the biggest winner of all. One of the best perks of my job is that I soak in sanctification truths every day, all day, year in, and year out. The more you teach, the more you will learn and grow. Now, before I wrap up, I do want to mention two traps that does connect to uh, what I've been sharing with you. The first one is bad experiences. Some believers have had bad experiences with other Christians. And in those cases, the temptation would be to map their bad experience over what God could do redemptively in their lives. And so when they hear something like this about reciprocality among Christians, about inviting people uh, into your space for corrective care, sometimes a bad experience can be a person's worst enemy. It can also make you cynical about future grace, always thinking the worst about people's motives. Don't do that. Have faith in God. May your faith in God be greater than whatever the mechanisms of humanity have been. Let your faith in God's current process overcome the past evil that someone did to you. God's grace can outmaneuver and defeat bad experiences regardless of what those bad experiences were. And so trap number one is bad experiences. Trap number two, isolating yourself. Don't isolate yourself from the community of faith. It is rare for a person to deteriorate in grace if they are actively pursuing gospel-shaped relationships. Isolation is the enemy's victory. We need loving and intentional friends interested in personal and practical exploration of life change. Most of the time when I get in trouble, I isolate myself from the community. Sitting, soaking, spectating on Sundays will not help you. You must engage God. You must engage others to change your life. Be open. Be honest. Be taught. Expect reproof. Anticipate correction. All these things will release you to run a spiritually productive race. I've titled this Four Sequential Steps to Change Your Life. You can find everything that I should just shared with you at lifeovercoffee.com. Here is the call to action. Would you take the time to work through all the questions that I have asked you? It would benefit you if you brought along a friend for the journey. You can mutually encourage each other with some intentional, intrusive, iron-sharpening conversations. Are you ready to do that? then let's start running. Let me finish with a word from the Lord. Let us, lay also, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2. God bless. Thanks for joining us. Learn more and get access to other resources at lifeovercoffee.com.